Good afternoon, students. How are you doing? I hope you all are doing great. You're welcome once again to today's edition of e-learning on economics. We are still dwelling on the topic population. Population. You remember when we started with population, we explained the meaning of population to be that it's a, it's, a, it's the number of people that occupy a particular geographical territory or country at a particular time. We also went ahead to talk about um, factors that determine population growth. In other words, determinants of population size or growth. And the factors we identified were broadly categorized into three, which are birth rate, death rate, and um, migration. The birth rate is also known as natality or fertility rate, while the death rate is known as mortality rate. I hope you still recall all these, but I have not seen your assignments. So I am expecting that you will send your assignments across. Okay, today we will be continuing with sub uh, topics under that lesson. And today we'll be looking at theories of population. Theories of population. We'll be discussing two theories, which are the Malthusian theory of population and the demographic theory of population. Now, the first one on the board is Malthusian population theory. As you can see on the board, this theory is an outcome of an essay that was written by Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus. He's a, he was a clergyman who was also a political economist of that time. That was in the 18th century in Europe, specifically Britain or England. So he wrote an essay which has become the, the basis for his postulations. His postulations were gathered from the essay he wrote on population in 1798. He highlighted the relationship between population and the means of subsistence. Means of subsistence here refers to things that uh, sustain uh, people, like food, clothing, and shelter. So these are the main features of his theory on population. The first one is that population was growing at a geometric progression while food production was growing at an arithmetic production. Geometric production means that population is growing in a multiplier effect. While arithmetic progression means that population is growing in addition effect. So now, that is why you see we have geometric progression of population here rising from 2 to 4, from 4 to 8, 8 times, 8 times 2, 16, 16 times 2, 32, and so on. But food, which is a means to sustain the people that were growing in number, was not going to be enough to sustain them. And this food we are talking about is growing slowly compared to the rate of population. Growing from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, which of course there is a huge discrepancy. And another postulation of Malthus was that there is a tendency for all living things to grow beyond the food available to them. Of course, it has been captured even in the first uh, 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 feature. And then the third feature is that unless population decreases, sorry, increases, Okay, I take that again. That unless population increase is matched with the means of sustenance, that negative and positive checks will come into force. What Marcus was trying to say is that if population growth is not proportionate, in other words, it's not equal with the growth also in food production, there will be problems such as 
wars, epidemics, famine, etc. These, these things I mentioned are what he calls positive checks. They will come into play to compel population to reduce in order to match up with the available means of sustenance. In other words, to match up with food production. That explains the food feature here. That the checks can be war, diseases, epidemics, and famine. And then number five, that population is essentially limited by the means of sustenance. That is self-explanatory. Population will be forced to reduce by these positive checks, which we have identified as war, diseases, epidemics, and famine. All these things compel the number of people to reduce because they bring, they, they inflict uh, uh, death, casualties, and all that, which, of course, will force the number of people to reduce to the number of food available. Now, we are going to look at um, things that have proven these theories of Malthus to be right and wrong. To be either right or wrong. First, we will start with the wrong sides. That is, developments that have proven Malthusian theory to be wrong. If you look at the first one on the board, it says food production increased as a result of improvements in farming, in farming techniques brought about by agrarian and industrial revolutions. If you would recall, in some of your lessons you've had in several subjects, even in business studies, for example, you will recall that there was a time we discussed uh, industrial revolution, which occurred in the 19th century in Europe. Yes, it came under the topic consumerism, consumerism in business studies. It was an era that witnessed uh, explosive production of goods and services, which were so great in quantity that they were like going to be wasted if consumers did not get enough of these goods and services. So you see that goods and services were more than available consumers, more than what consumers asked for in the industrial revolution era. So this point is refuting the fact that there will be a time, according to Malthus, where number of people will outgrow the level of food production. The Industrial Revolution and the, agrag uh, and the Agrarian uh, Revolutions have proven Malthus wrong in that regard. And then number two, there was also a time where many new lands, such as America, America was not originally owned by the Americans of today. It was a land occupied by the Red Indians until the British conquered that land, developed it, and then they could also exploit the resources on that land to cater for their needs at home in Europe. So the discovery of this land, such as America, you will also agree that Africa was also discovered by the Europeans. Australia, etc. now opened uh, possibilities for migration to take place, intercontinental migrations and all that, which enabled people on that were on higher population sites to come to places of lower population to get some form of self sustenance. And then number three, there were improvements in the means of transportation which made it easy for food and raw materials to be transported 
from the new lands that we discovered to Europe. Of course, in the colonial era, you will agree with me that the colonial masters or the Europeans that came used to uh, take our natural resources back to Europe, such as our oil palm, um, our timber, um, and a lot of natural resources, which they transported back to Europe to sustain the number of uh, population they had abroad. And then number four, in Britain, for instance, people started having smaller families intentionally, not because they were afraid of food shortages, but because having a small family size, such as two or three children, became fanciful, became something that people well, was becoming trendy. People no longer fancied large families, as it were, in, in times past. So these refutes Maltusian theories on population. And then, number five, much of the effects of Malthus positive checks were reduced because of advancement in medical science and technology. You will agree with me that in those days it was like survival of the fittest, where the scarce resources were being scrambled for by those that had might. So stronger territories or countries or groups or individuals would always fight the weaker ones, eliminate them and take over their land so that they can inherit the resources to sustain them Cells. But with time, these things were no longer necessary because there were now advancements in medical science, in technology, food production increased. There was no need for people to fight again. In fact, excess food was now available, excess materials, excess, a lot of things were now in excess. So there was no need for people to really fight over these things again. There was no need for people to experience um, wars and uh, pandemics like we are experiencing today. Now, let's look at number six. There was interdependency of nations for goods and services through international trade. Now, countries that had surplus materials, surplus means of sustenance, surplus food, surplus natural resources that didn't know how to preserve them could now sell these goods to other countries that were lacking in these resources for money. So nations that didn't have could now depend on nations that had excess to buy from them. Just like Nigeria, we have excess of crude oil in our lands. It has become our major source of sustenance. All right, now we'll be looking at developments that have proven Malthusian theory right. What are those things that makes... Um, what are those things that makes a Malthusian theory to be right? Those things are the things we are going to look at before we continue to the next theory of population. Number one, there are negative attitudes of people such as the practice of polygamy and multiple child births, which have increased population of many developing countries, like countries in Africa, for instance, are developing countries. You see that it is in Africa that we practice most of these um, things I've mentioned, such as polygamy and uh, the belief that the larger the number of children you have, the more you become relevant in the society. So these things tend to make uh, Malthus theory believe. So these things like polygamy and multiple childbirths, which is predominantly practiced here in Africa or in developing countries, uh, makes one believe 
that the population growth or population size has outnumbered or outweighed the number of um, food supplies. And then number two, that the population of many developing countries is growing geometrically while food production is growing arithmetically. This is a support of the first point which I uh, stated earlier. If you look at developing countries closely, you will discover that people are still having large families. I came from a family of eight people, for instance. There are others from ten, some even as much as twelve. And if you look at northern Nigeria, for instance, people are still marrying up to three, four wives. And that is forcing population to, to, to expand, to increase at a geometrical rate. But you also discover that poverty is ravaging these places that are overpopulated, places that the number of people are more than what they have to sustain them. For example, if you go to northern Nigeria, it is the most poor inflicted area in the whole of Nigeria. The whole of North, because they believe in polygamy, they believe in having so many number of children, and their population tends to outweigh the resources they have. And that is why they are forced most times to depend on the resources from the south, from the southern part of Nigeria, which uh, makes us to see the realities in what Malthus talked about. And then number three, there is difficulty in eradicating poverty in many poor countries. Taking Nigeria, for example, as a case study, you discover that all the world organizations make donations for poverty alleviation to Nigeria. And a large chunk of this money is usually to uh, channeled to the northern part of Nigeria. Yet, the north has failed to be eradicated from poverty up till today. This proves, uh, this um, number three points we are talking about, there is difficulty in eradicating poverty in many poor countries. So that, that, that means that the, the effect of a, high, a larger population compared to food production is evident according to what uh, Malthus had feared. And then number four, there is rapid population growth which militates against rapid economic development in many developing countries. Still using Nigeria as a case study. Nigeria has not been able to develop. It is still struggling to develop. In fact, Nigeria has stagnated. That is if it has not uh, 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 retrogressed in terms of development. Why? Because the statistics showed in a few years uh, ago that Nigeria had a population of 150 million. And in a space of few years, it was recorded 180 million. As I'm talking to you now, Nigeria is recording over 200 million. But infrastructures are not in place to, to, to be, you know, to match up with this number of people. Jobs are not increased to match up with the number of people that have increased. Food supply have not increased to also match up. All these things makes us to believe uh, the Malthus theory on population, these fears. And then number five, there is falling standard of living of many developing countries as a result of increase in population. And as, as, as a result of these other points we have stated, you discover that the standard of living has dropped. People are not living comfortably again. People cannot even afford three square meals. In fact, a lot of majority of Nigerians go to bed hungry. They can't even afford to buy cars, which are basic necessities in developed countries. They can't get houses. House rents have become so expensive for them to afford. And all these things have uh, shown that Malthus was right, that an over overly populated country will lead to a fall in the standard of living. These are things we are witnessing today in Africa, especially in Nigeria.
Now, we are done with Malthus' theory of population. Let us look at the next theory of population, which is known as demographic transition theory. What is demographic transition theory? This theory provides a historical insight into the population problems of developing countries. It tends to explain why developed countries went through three identical stages of population, which we are going to discuss. The first stage is the pre-industrial or pre-transition phase. Developing countries at this stage had a stable or very slow growing population as a result of high birth rates which were uh, accompanied also by high birth, uh, high birth rates. So high death rate equates, almost equates with high birth rates. So even if you have, you put you, you put to bed 10 children today and 9 dies out of the 10. It means there is almost an equal proportion. Alright, as I was saying, the transition phase is characterized by high death rates accompanied by high birth rates. So, as people are being given birth to, people are also dying. This is the first phase in the demographic transition theory. One feature of this phase is that there is a relatively stable population because people are dying. Almost, almost the same number of people that are dying are the same number of people that are being given birth to. So it's like a replacement of those that are passing away. Now, this is this was what was experienced at this stage. Then, developing countries now migrated to the next stage, which is known as... Pardon me, I was trying to explain pre-industrial or pre-transition stage. Well, everything I explained was about the pre-transition stage which I said that death rate it almost equates with birth rate, thereby leading to a stable level of population. And then the next phase of population, uh, the next phase of uh, the transition theory is, the demographic transition theory is a transition stage where we now have a rapidly growing population as a result of higher birth rates compared to the death rates. In other words, we have more births than deaths, resulting into an explosive population. This stage marks the beginning of the demographic transition, and it is this stage that many third world countries, such as Nigeria, is experiencing. Now let's look at the third stage of the demographic transition, uh, demographic transition theory. Sorry. Now it is called post-transition phase. This is a period of declining or low birth rates and low death rates, leading again to a relatively stable population. It is a stage where the number of people that dies are low compared to the number of people that are given birth to. The number of people that are given birth to is also almost equally low with the number of people that dies. So, at this phase, population becomes stable or is growing very slowly, very slowly. I hope you get. Good. Now, we are going to look at arguments or criticisms in favor or against this demographic transition theory. Okay. 
Here we have arguments or criticisms against this demographic uh, transition theory we have been talking about. Some people have criticized this theory with the following points. Number one, that it is completely wrong to use the theory, which was only relevant in Europe, to generalize its application in every uh, part of the globe that these things, the instances that the theory was uh, developed from was centered in Europe. Even the Malthusian theory, if you look at Malthus, he was looking at Britain specifically when he was uh, developing his uh, theories and all that, even these are uh, demographic theory. So it is somehow parochial. It is not to be generalized. And then number two, that Krugbeck rate widely used in the theory is not the only way to measure fertility. Number three, the main causes of decline in population may be different in different countries. In other words, the causes of population reduction in one country, it may not be the same cause for another country. For some countries, it may be uh, high death rates, while some countries may be uh, problems of emigration, etc. And then number four, demographic theory fails to predict the levels of birth rate and death rate. This is where we will come to the end of the class for today but before I go I would like you to take down the assignment which is explain the meanings of overpopulation, underpopulation and optimum population. Number two, what are the causes of population growth in Africa? In other words, what is the cause of overpopulation in Africa? And then number three, how can population growth be controlled in Nigeria? Answer these questions, send them across to me and I'll mark them. Uh, I think this is the end of the lesson. See you next time. God.